in this second week of Advent, for any church that follows uh, the lectionary, the set of readings, John the Baptist appears every year. And so today we hear from him, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Listen for God's word. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is one of, the, of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the word of the Lord. It is already the second week of Advent, and I have been wondering... For several days now, I have been wondering how this season feels for all of you. Now that we are in the full swing of it. Does this time of year feel heavy or light for you? Does it feel burdensome? Does it feel freeing for you? In church world, we would ask, does Christmas bring you joy? And in non-church world, we would say, does Christmas make you happy? (laughs) And I've been wondering how it's making you feel this year. You know, there is a whole science that studies happiness. Did you know that? They do study after study to see how happiness works in our lives. One of the ones of about six or seven years ago, really surprised the scientists who studied it. Here's what they did. They studied uh, Olympic medal winners. Happy people, right? And their assumption going into the study was um, that the happiness level would match the medal. So, So that the gold medal winners would be the happiest, and then the silver medal winners, the next happiest, and then the bronze, the next happiest. That's what they thought would happen when they began their study. Can you guess what they found? I mean, the gold medal winners were the happiest. Okay, they they were. They were the happiest, but then the surprise came. The silver medal winners were not the next happiest. In fact, they were not happy at all. The bronze winners were the next happiest. They even did some facial recognition and imaging on these athletes uh, in the 2012 Olympics, actually. And they then went back and studied their faces. And when the bronze winners won their heat or their sport, two-thirds of them broke into a huge grin immediately. Two-thirds of them. When the silver medal winners won, guess how many of them broke into a smile? Zero. Zero. What the scientists found was that the silver medalists were focusing all their attention on what might have been, on what almost was. They almost got that gold, but they didn't. And the bronze medalists, in contrast, were focused on gratitude. 
They knew they were this close from not being on the podium at all. Christmas carries some heavy baggage with it. It can carry the baggage of what might have been, or perhaps what we believe once was. We call that nostalgia, and this season is full of it. And there is nothing wrong with a little nostalgia. Uh, Put on some cozy socks and listen to a carol that you know will make you think of your mother. There's nothing wrong with that. Or sit in silence and quiet for a time period this season and, and remember those Christmases when you were a child or when your children were small. There is nothing wrong with that. But the problem becomes when nostalgia plays a trick on us. Nostalgia can play a trick on us. When we look back in our memories, two things can happen. The first is we iron out the difficult times, thank God. (laughs) But when we look back, we only remember the best. And then second, what can happen is that over the years, there is so much emotional weight added to those memories that nothing today can ever compete. And and even the memories themselves cannot bear it. When nostalgia comes that way to us, when that becomes our experience of Christmas, then no other Christmas can ever live up to our memories. It will always fail. And no other Advent, we think, will we feel as close to God as we did in the Advent of 1997 or 1951 or last year. We can live our Christmases as the silver medalist, always looking for the gold. We can clutch that silver medal and just be upset because of what we once had or might never have. The New Testament professor, David Bartlett, he put it this way. He said, nostalgia is memory filtered filtered through disproportionate emotion. Nostalgia is our memory, but then filtered through disproportionate amounts of emotion. And that's what happens to us at Christmas. It can. And I tell you, if it happens to us, it is a dead end. If it goes too far, it will leave us feeling empty and bereft. Bartlett finishes his statement with this. He says, but faith, in contrast to nostalgia, faith is memory filtered through appropriate gratitude. Also memory but through appropriate gratitude. So nostalgia is memory that rests in what might have once been or what we don't have now, and faith is memory that rests in thankfulness. And thankfulness, gratitude, is what Advent and Christmas are all about. We need a moment to remind ourselves of what is actually happening here at Christmas, that we are lucky to have even made the podium at all. Let's take a few moments uh, in order, if we could. We lit a candle today. If you remember the name of this week's candle, it was the Bethlehem candle. Now, I have never, I don't mean Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I have never been to Bethlehem myself. Raise your hand if you have been to Bethlehem. One, two, three, four, five. Five of us have been to Bethlehem. And I stand here with certainty that none of us call it our hometown. And yet this story is set in Bethlehem. We hang ornaments on our tree that are literally in Greek (laughs) that we cannot read. Because it is not our mother language, but it is the language that the gospel writers spoke and wrote in and read in. 
Mary, Joseph, John, even King Herod in the story, they were all Middle Eastern Jews who lived 2,000 years ago, 7,000 miles from here. I looked it up. And they were fulfilling and being part of fulfilling 3,000 years of Jewish history up until that moment. These are not our people. And this is not our story. They don't speak our language and we don't speak theirs. We barely comprehend their time and their place. When we hear the Christmas story, it has become so familiar to us. But when we hear the Christmas story, we are overhearing the promises that were made to someone else. We are overhearing that. It is not our story. First, it was a story and a promise to Mary and her family. Then it spread to the ancient Jews of Judah, the Semitic peoples of that land, and then finally to the pagans in the Roman Empire, and so on and so on. These are promises that were made to them. We overhear it. And then every year at Advent... Some of those promises are offered in this strange man, John the Baptist. And for most of us, when he shows up at Advent, he's sort of in our way. We say, let's get to the manger already, and the shepherds and the angels. And here is John in his camel's hair, his wild clothing. But I don't want you to skip over John this year. I don't want you to be upset with him that he is in your way because he offers some of the best good news that you and I could ever hear. He offers some of the best good news, and he does it in a very abrasive way, but he is a very abrasive guy. You remember what happened when he was baptizing there on the banks of the Jordan, and some representatives of Jewish leadership came, and he said to them, He said, I know you are proud of yourselves because you are children of Abraham. And then he said this, I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. That was it. Did you hear the good news? That was it. He just told them that God can add to his family any time he wants. And that God can raise up new children for himself, even from the most unlikely of ingredients. It turns out, in the birth of Jesus, that is just what God did. Paul puts it this way in the Romans passage that Phil read. He writes, I tell you. Christ has come so that the Jews would know that God keeps promises and so the Gentiles would know of God's mercy. Christ came for those two reasons, so that the Jews would know that God keeps his promises and the Gentiles would know of God's mercy. For Jews, God is a promise keeper. They have indeed won, as he said they would. And for Gentiles, outsiders, you and me, God has shown us mercy because we have been brought into a story that is not ours. We have been welcomed into a family and grafted onto their family tree that is not ours. We have been given promises that are not ours. We are the bronze winners at Christmas. Let the memory of this deepen your faith at Advent, in the Advent season, in every season, for we should be grateful that we are even on the podium at all. You know the famous story that Jesus told, that famous parable of those workers, and some of them work all day long, and some of them only work for an hour, and then at the end of the day, they line up, and the master pays them all the same amount. And Jesus tells that story, and we get upset. But we well know that we only get upset because we assumed we were at the front of the line. Who ever said we were first place? Who ever said that? You are not the gold medal winner here. And I am not the silver medal winner here. We are the bronze medal winners. 
We are grateful to have been invited. Don't let nostalgia have its way with you this year. It will try. A little of it is nice, but too much of it, and we will spend the season thinking of what might have been, or of perhaps what once was. And Christmas is not a season of nostalgia. Christmas is a season of faith that is based in gratitude. What might have been does not matter one bit for what has happened. For I tell you, God is able to raise up new children. And he did. And he has. And that makes us all winners. Amen. Let us take a few moments of silent reflection.